Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, let's go. So I worked security for a major military contractor at one point. Our supervisor liked using our random search number as a tool for punishment for perceived grievances with us. Normally, our search number was something around 1525, meaning we would only pull over and search every 15th car and every contractor truck. It was very cold and very miserable in the mornings when we would suddenly have a couple hundred employees and contractors show up between 500 800. This day, our supervisor got upset because when he came in at 400 for his day shift, he was the 15th car. Deciding that he must now ruin everyone else's day, even though we did our best to search his vehicle promptly, but completely, so he couldn't say we weren't doing the searches completely. So he set the day shift search number to three. So we complied. There was only enough room for three cars' trucks to be pulled over at once, and once that was done, we would usually stop searches until the others were completed, keeping traffic moving. Not today. This time, we filled the search area and then stopped traffic until all three vehicles were cleared then allow two cars through, pull over the third, allow two, pull third, allow two, pull third, stop all traffic, and start searches. We ended up with a line of cars waiting to get into the plant that went two miles long. It got so long the local police got involved up the road as people were blocking traffic in some intersection. Then came the phone call from a three-star general that stuck in that said traffic a mile up the road. Suddenly, we were called to cease all searches for the morning. I later heard that it had been too little too late to cancel the ridiculous searches, and our major military contractor lost a billion-dollar contract out of the deal. And that supervisor was initially going to be fired, but negotiated his way to just being busted down to a regular guard. We were union, so he started lowest on the seniority chart and got stuck working all the mandatory overtime and all the worst posts, including the one he had made miserable that morning. Edit. I should have noted that two weeks later, said contract was renegotiated after the company I worked for explained that the person responsible for the general's limousine being held up in traffic for almost an hour had been reassigned. No innocent jobs were lost in the making of this MC. For some backstory, I worked as a valet in a small coastal city in college and the restaurants I worked for were very popular for both locals and tourists. We'd generally be busy year-round, but as the restaurants are both water, Front spring, summer, early fall are our peak seasons per set. The downside to these restaurants is that parking can be a huge pain. Combined, the restaurants can seat around 400 people at any given time and can usually turn over about 2,500 seats on a busy weekend. But the parking lot can only hold about 60, 70 cars at a time, which isn't much at all. That's why I, the valet, am there. We have about 25, 30 designated valet spots used to have double that amount, but I digress, and are really good about utilizing all of them efficiently so we can park as many cars as possible, thus getting as many tips as possible. Being that the valet spots are kind of in a weird spot, but really close to the restaurants in our stand, and there aren't any signs that say valet only, we usually show up a bit early and cone the spots off so people know they aren't for self-parking. Now, most people see the cones and recognize those spots are pretty clearly not available, but some people are so dumb or jerks that they will move the cones and park in our spots anyways. Disclaimer, there is a parking garage for overflow parking, but people don't particularly like using it. People do this pretty regularly, and we're usually pretty cool about it. One of the valets will normally just walk up to them as they are parking and tell them that the spot is reserved for valet, and they'll usually comply. Obviously, this was not the case yesterday, or I wouldn't be writing this right now. While we were in full swing last night, some douche, bag is not 100 feet from me moving a cone so he can try to sneakily take one of our spots. I was talking to a customer so I wasn't able to immediately go tell him to not park there. After finishing up talking, I walked over to douche as he was getting out of his car and immediately knew I had encountered this exact guy trying to do this nonsense before. After this encounter, I knew revenge was going to be necessary. Our conversation went as follows. I told him, Hey man, I'm sorry but these spots are for valet only. That's why we have the cones set up. If you'd like to self-park, you can park in this main lot, pointing to the full lot, or in the parking garage. 
but there's nowhere to park in that lot, and I don't want to park in the parking garage. You guys always do this to me. So if I validate it, I could park here. That's nonsense, bro. I'm parking here whether you like it or not. I was pretty taken aback and basically just walked away, not wanting to get into a fight over a parking spot. I knew it was time this guy learned his lesson. Now, I don't have the authority to tow his car or give him a boot, and I wouldn't anyways because I'm not a jerk, but my power is in the pure number of cars I have access to. Luckily, he did this at about 8 p.m. I contractually only have to be there until 10 p.m., at which time I can park the remaining cars in certain places and then leave the keys with the bartenders inside. Most nights I would stay to get the tips, but tonight I was dropping keys. Conveniently, Douche had parked in the area where we move cars to before we dropped the keys. My plan. Use the validated cars to block douche in, and then leave with him having no way of leaving until the cars around him left. There was one car that would be particularly important, the one directly in front of him. I had a special car for that spot. It was owned by a restaurant employee that I knew wouldn't be off until 2 a.m. Perfect. I maneuvered all the cars around him in a way that didn't make me look like I was intentionally blocking him, but in a way that made it look like I had no other choice. Everything fell into place perfectly, and I could already feel a justice chub starting to form. I went inside to drop the keys and explain to the restaurant manager what happened, and my revenge. She loves us and said she'd 100 have our backs, which I figured she would. I told her to text me and tell me how everything played out. This is the text I received last night at around 11 p.m. The guy just came up to me mad. He said there was a car blocking him from leaving and that it needed to be moved immediately so he could leave. I tried to explain that you guys have to put cars there before you leave and that you even told him to not park there. I guess that made him mad, so he started raising his voice at me. His e-bar manager saw and told me that he had been drinking for a while, which I assumed from the beginning. I told him that I couldn't, for liability reasons, allow him to drive home since he had been drinking. He got really mad because he lives 40 minutes drive away, but ended up taking an expensive Uber home. She told me she slipped in the argument that he was going to get another ride whether he liked it or not. Edit. Just a couple things to add to clarify some things. This is a privately owned parking lot, as most parking lots are. The restaurants who owned it gave us permission to use this lot and told us where they wanted our spots to be. Just because something is open to the public doesn't mean it's not privately owned. These restaurants also did not want us towing booting cars. 99 of the time, Us going up and telling people they couldn't park there was sufficient and they would move or give us their keys and we could move their car if needed. If not, we'd whine to them but ultimately wouldn't, couldn't do much. This happened several years ago. I no longer live in this town nor valet. There were some signs that said valet parking only, just not enough in my opinion. Like two signs for 2025 spots. I worked for this tech company for almost seven years. It was my first job out of college. Great company, huge growth, great benefits, and most importantly, an incredible boss. The boss was super helpful and responsive, always had the team's back, goes out of his way to not micromanage, didn't care as long as the work got done, borderline forced people to take PTO. We have unlimited and I averaged 30, 40 days off a year and believed in giving good workers big raises and promotions. Last three years, I got nine, 13, and a promotion, and seven raises. We worked remote through COVID, and I asked to change my contract to fully remote so I could leave the HCOL city where the office was based to go back to my hometown. Boss approved the change, and when HR tried to do a coal adjustment to my salary, boss told them no because I'll be doing the same work in my new location. The boss was so good that on our team of 16 people, the lowest tenured was 3.5 years. I've been offered several other jobs with salary increases throughout the years, but could never bring myself to leave. Myself and one other person on my team had specialized into working on very complex and involved projects. These were significantly different than the team's normal day-to-day work. We'd been doing the complex projects for four years and were the knowledge base for the company in that area. Boss left that area completely to us to manage it. As the volume picked up, we added and trained two more people to our little sub-team to help out. None of these projects went out to the customers without one of us four being involved. Super complex. 100 Ks to millions lost if a mistake was made. And since it was the fastest growing part of the business by far, we were super busy. 
now around two years ago. Boss's boss gets promoted from his VP role up to an SVP spot and hires a new VP. This new VP comes in and tries to change a lot very quickly. Tries to make everything a trackable metric. Even where it really doesn't make sense. I.e., tracking the number of projects each person on my team did every month. Counted as one, even if it was super complex and took two weeks, or if it was very simple with an existing customer and took an hour. Wanted each project to go out faster. Even if they weren't due for a week, we were supposed to get them out in under three days. Tried to force my boss to assign work to the team instead of us all picking up from a central queue as we could, etc. Boss pushed back as much as possible, but was getting shit on constantly by new VIP because the useless metrics VP wanted us tracked by did not meet his super unrealistic expectations. Despite my boss's team being the most experienced and efficient in the company and doing significantly more volume and more complex work than any other team, about nine months ago, boss had enough of just getting consistently shit on by VIP and took a new job and left. Boss had been with the company for 13 years and was one of the first few 100 employees. My whole team was devastated. We all instantly started lobbying for the most tenured person on our team to get promoted into that role, as she would have the same philosophy as the boss that just left. VP interviews most tenured and a bunch of external candidates, and goes with someone from his previous company. Now this lady will be referred to as witch boss from here on out for soon-to-be-obvious reasons. She came in and completely destroyed the team from top to bottom. Changed processes that had been perfected for years, did not listen or care about what anyone else had to say. Started micromanaging to the extreme. Team morale dropped like a rock. It took less than a month for the team's output to crater due to all of her changes. The team from the best in the company to the worst. It took Witch Boss about two months to get to my smaller sub-team and try to rework our processes. Witch Boss started micromanaging projects, having no idea what she's doing, and causing all kinds of issues and delays. She started getting on us four about our metrics being the worst on the team. Despite us working on the super complex projects that took 10, 100 times longer on average than most of the work the rest of the team did, Witch Boss told us that if we didn't meet the expected metrics, we would be put on PIP. So we decided to comply and focused all of our efforts on simple projects to meet the metrics X number of projects completed per month per person and left the complex ones sitting in the queue. This caused chaos as my small sub-team suddenly stopped picking up complex projects and just focused on completing simple projects to get our metrics up. Very quickly, the sales team is freaking out because deals are getting delayed and their huge commission checks from the complex projects are being put in jeopardy. When they came to us to ask when we were going to complete the complex projects, we all gave the same response. Which bosses told us we have to focus all of our efforts on meeting metric X, so we will only be doing that. Unfortunately, that means we can no longer complete the complex project. Please contact Witch Boss for help getting them completed. This did not go over well with her or VIP, as he started to get complaints as well. They called a meeting and told us we had to go back to doing a complex project. We refused as that made it impossible to meet the metric they created to measure our performance. They refused to drop the metric, but still insisted we work on the complex ones as we were the only ones with the knowledge. We still refused. This resulted in a lot more complaints from sales until the SUVP got involved. The SUVP was the one who created the complex sub-team to begin with and sided with us against the VP and witch boss. He said we were not to be measured by the metrics and can go back to managing the complex stuff without fear of being put on a pipe. So we did. At this point, the other three people on the sub-team had seen the writing on the wall and were all actively applying and trying to leave ASAP. They were all office-based in the HCOL area still. Which boss changed the team from come in one, two days a week as needed to mandatory three days in the office. Most company policy would let her... So, they got a lot more of her B's than I did remote. I had not been applying because I was distracted. My old boss had approved two weeks of vacation for my wedding honeymoon before he left. This happened about three months after Witch Boss started, and about a month after the whole pit blow up. Witch Boss was pissed at how we showed her up in front of the CVP and was doing everything she could to make our life miserable. In that month, the other super experienced guy and my best friend on the sub team got a new job and left, 
no notice. And one of the other guys on the sub team has put in his notice and only had a week left. We were already slammed and still behind from the pip fiasco, so losing half the sub team just made that worse. Plus, with morale so low, we didn't bother to put in any extra effort anymore. In fact, the whole team was significantly behind as six of the 16 people had left or were on their notice periods at that point. So which boss decided that she was canceling my already approved wedding leave because of how far the team was behind? She told me over Zoom. I told her there was no chance I'm missing my wedding and honeymoon for work and I'm taking the full leave and it's up to her if she wants to lose another person from the sub team for two weeks or permanently. She be sad, yelled, and threatened until I just left the Zoom call. She followed up with an email officially notifying me my leave was canceled, and if I didn't show up, it would be considered job abandonment. I called her bluff and replied seeking VP and SVP and some other sales VPs who I worked with regularly, explaining the situation, it's my wedding honeymoon, and that I appreciated the opportunity but was quitting immediately with no notice due to the disrespect from which boss. I got Slack messages from SVP and several of the sales VPs almost immediately asking me not to quit. The email chain itself blew up with complaints about how my team was mismanaged by which boss and how now more complex deals were going to get lost because I wouldn't be there at all to work on them act. SVP eventually shut it down, but it was a fun read. I didn't reply to the Slack messages or do any work the rest of that day. Just turned everything off and went to a bar and had a good time. I woke up the next day late in the morning and very hungover to a few voicemails on my phone from SUVP asking me to call him. I called back in the early afternoon and talked to the SUVP. He was very understanding, asked me to come back, listened to all my complaints, and eventually made an offer. Basically, if I came back and worked the rest of the week and tried to train a few team members to work on complex stuff to cover while I was gone, he would give me a $3,000 wedding bonus. I would get my full PTO. And when I got back, which boss would leave me alone and let me manage the complex stuff and pick two more people to permanently train back onto the sub-team to back, fill what we had lost? I accepted, weddings are damn expensive. So I tried to train people to cover for me, impossible task, then leave on my PTO. I had a great wedding and honeymoon. VP called me a few times when the fourth guy from my sub-team quit with no notice about 1.5 weeks in, but I ignored him and didn't respond. I come back refreshed and ready for the shit show I know is waiting. It was chaos. All the salespeople were slacking and emailing me about all the complex things they needed done two weeks ago. The people I quickly trained before leaving hadn't been able to do almost anything. There was a huge backlog for the entire team as half of the original 16-person team was gone at this point. I turned off my Slack and emailed the sales VPs directly asking them to give me a prioritized list of all the complex deals they needed done. Got the list and started working through it in my normal working hours. Nothing more. Which boss never tried to talk to me or interfere. VP did a few times. At one point he tried to make me work weekends to catch up. I refused. This went on for about a month or so. Which boss never mentioned me training people to replace my subteam and I never brought it up. They did, however, have the larger team try some of the smaller complex projects to help get them out. They also hired some new people for the larger team. The normal four, six month training process my old boss developed was ignored, and the new hires were just thrown in the deep end, which resulted in new hires making mistakes that cost the company a lot of money. This brought us to annual bonus and raised time. I had started frantically job hunting as soon as I got back from the honeymoon. I got some interviews, was in same later stages, but no offers yet. I had a Zoom meeting invite from which boss to go over my bonus rate. She decided it would be a great idea to give me 80 of my expected bonus, lowest possible, and a zero rate. Justified it with a bunch of Bs, not a team player, metric bad, blaming me for mistakes made by new hires, ekdek. I didn't really argue or care at that point. At that point, I really quiet quit. Cut my daily output to below half, just did the bare, bare minimum and waited for the bonus to come in with my next paycheck two weeks later. At this point, the sales team is getting pissed because the complex stuff basically isn't getting done. I had almost caught up on the important ones before the raise bonus, but with me barely working, everything was falling behind again. Which boss smelled weakness and showed up on one of the progress calls I had with sales. The project was running about 1.5 weeks behind at that point. 
She started chewing me out on the call in front of everyone saying I was lazy and not doing my job act. I let her rant then just said if you give me the lowest bonus possible and a 0 D raise you get zero in effort in return. You can complete this project since I'm so terrible at my job and left the call. She tried a few more times on email chains, etc. to call me out for not working and I just replied with the same thing. I refused to join her Zoom calls or respond to her on Slack and just responded with the zero effort blurb on every email. This infuriated her. I still hadn't gotten another job offer, but was really confident I was about to get one soon. So when VP set up a Zoom call with me, I joined. He tried to play nice and ask what the problems were and pretended to be on my side. I told him for a zero raise, I'm giving zero effort, and he pretended like he had no idea how I ended up with that raise bonus. He has to approve the bonus raise amounts. I called him out on his bees and told him he gets what he pays for. He then threatened to fire me if I didn't go back my old level of output and said the people I had been training in complex projects could take over for me soon, so I wasn't as necessary as I thought. I laughed and asked him what he was talking about. I hadn't been training anyone. He went quiet and muted. He was clearly messaging which boss asking about the training, because he unmuted a few minutes later and changed his entire attitude. Agreed it was awful of which boss to do that to my bonus raise and asked what he could do to make it right. I didn't care at that point and knew he needed me more than I needed him, so I told him I needed 25's raise and 150's of the bonus on that new salary, or I was quitting immediately. He tried to say that was ridiculous and could never happen at deck. So I bluffed and told him I already had another job offer and was leaving anyway. He asked me to wait and he'd bring SUVP onto the call. SVP tried to talk my demand down. At that point, I realized it wasn't worth it, I refused the significantly lower counteroffer, thanked the SUVP for everything he did for me, and said I was quitting immediately. VP tried to say, I'll never get a good reference if I don't at least work a notice period. I just told him my ex-boss would give me a glowing recommendation of my time here, so I didn't care and logged off. SVP tried to get me to come back a few times over the next week or so, but I refused. A few weeks later, I got a job offer and accepted. I've been working at the new company for a while now, and it's pretty shitty. Better than the old company, but nowhere close to what I had before with my old boss. Although old boss reached out and said he might have a position opening up in his new company in a month or two that I should apply for. So, I'm looking forward to that? I've heard from people who are still on my old team that it's complete disaster at my old job. They are losing millions from not having the knowledge base to correctly complete the complex projects. They reached out to the other experienced guy from the sub-team and offered him a huge raise to come back after I quit. He refused. Everyone left on my old team is trying to leave ASAP, and everything, even the simple stuff, is weeks overdue. Apparently, which boss is getting thrown under the bus by VP and will be fired soon. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. All right, so there I was, post-gym sweat dripping and muscles screaming for mercy. Decided to treat myself to some sauna time, you know, like the fitness gods intended. After a quick shower that probably lasted longer than it should have, I strolled into the steamy embrace of the sauna, thinking it was smooth sailing from there. I shut the door behind me because, duh, that's how saunas work, right? Ain't no rocket science. It's just basic sauna etiquette. Little did I know, this move was about to kick off the saga of sauna wars. Just as I'm settling into the therapeutic heat, this woman, a real live steam serpent, opens the door and bolts out like she's got a sauna emergency or something. Probably had to share her latest workout achievements on the phone with her BFF, I don't know. Now, I ain't one to make enemies, but I'm not about to let the sauna's warmth escape into the gym wilderness. So I did the righteous thing, shut the door behind her. Lo and behold, she returns, mid-chat on the phone, and sees me enjoying the sauna with the door closed. She gives me that look, the one that could melt ice caps, and starts going off about how I can't just close the door. I tell her, look lady, it's sauna 101. The door stays shut. Keeps the sweat magic in or something. I don't know. Just feels right. She's having none of it, insisting I should get out. I'm like, hold up, Cinderella, this ain't your sauna kingdom. I'll sweat in peace if I damn well please. Well... That didn't sit right with her highness. She stormed off, probably plotting my sauna banishment. 
I shrugged it off, closed the door, and thought, that's the end of that drama. Oh boy, was I in for a sweatier ride than I bargained for? She gives me this look, a mix of annoyance and disbelief, like I'm trespassing on her sacred sauna grounds. You need to get out, she demands, all high and mighty. Now, I ain't one to shy away from a standoff, especially when it comes to a battle of wills in a sauna. I coolly tell her, why don't you join? It's roomy enough for two, maybe even three if you're feeling friendly. Oh boy, that set her off like a firework on 4th of July. She screeches, no way. I need my privacy. This is my alone time. I figure, fair enough, we all need our alone time especially in the midst of a steamy affair with the sauna. But my stubborn side kicks in, and I decide I'm not budging. Look, lady, I've got at least 20 more minutes of sauna serenity on my clock. Find another spot to brood. She shoots daggers at me like I just insulted her entire sauna lineage. I'm not comfortable with others, she spits out, as if sharing the sauna with me is the end of the world. I chuckle. Well, princess, you're just going to have to deal with it. This sauna ain't big enough for your... no sharing policy. She huffs, stomps her foot. Seriously, who does that? As storms out, muttering something about inconsiderate sauna barbarians. I lean back, close my eyes, and think sauna time waits for no one. The temperature rises, and so does the drama. After Sauna Queen stormed out, I figured I'd won the battle, claimed my throne of steamy victory. But oh no, the drama wasn't done cooking in this sauna saga. I'm there, Eyes closed, soaking up the heat like it's liquid gold, when I suddenly hear a distant cackling. I open one eye, thinking it's some gym jester pulling pranks. Lo and behold, it's none other than Sauna Queen herself, messing with the thermostat like it's her personal game of heat chess. I sit up, squinting through the sauna haze, and ask, What the hell are you doing? She smirks, devilish delight in her eyes. You want your precious twenty minutes? Let's see how you handle the heat, tough guy. Next thing I know, the temperature starts skyrocketing. I'm talking sauna turning into the fiery pits of Hades kind of hot. Sweat starts pouring like Niagara Falls, and I'm questioning if I accidentally stepped into a sauna-themed horror movie. I'm not one to back down, but this was a whole new level of sauna warfare. I shout over the sauna inferno, Are you trying to melt me, lady? She just laughs. A sinister melody of victory. You wanted your 20 minutes? Enjoy the sauna sauna hell. At this point, I'm practically gasping for air, feeling like I'm being slow, roasted by an angry sauna deity. Sauna queen exits with a triumphant grin, leaving me questioning my life choices. I tough it out, partly stubbornness, partly not willing to let sauna queen have the satisfaction of breaking me. Finally, the heat eases, and I stumble out of the sauna, feeling like I just survived an epic battle. I wipe the sweat from my face, thinking, well played, Sauna Queen, well played. Sauna Queen may have thought she won the first round, turning the heat up like she's auditioning for a villain role in a sauna-themed superhero movie. But vengeance, my friends, is a dish best served hot. And trust me, I'm about to turn up the heat in more ways than one. I stumble out of the inferno, feeling like I just walked through the Sahara in a snowsuit. My pride might be a little crispy around the edges, but my determination is still steaming. As I cool off, I plot my sweet, steamy revenge. It's time to show Sauna Queen that she's playing with the Sauna Master. I sneak out of the sauna area. A man with a mission, Operation Sauna Smackdown is a go. First stop, gym reception. I sweet, talk the receptionist into letting me borrow a roll of -of out-of-order tape. With that, I strut back to the sauna, a devious grin on my face. I wrap that sauna door with so much tape, you'd think it's in a crime scene. I even add a touch of dramatic flair by scribbling, sauna temporarily closed, technical difficulties. Now, I settle into the shadows, waiting for sauna queen to return and face the consequences of her sauna sabotage. Sure enough, she storms in, expecting to reclaim her steamy throne. Her eyes lock onto the taped-up door, confusion and frustration written all over her face. She turns to me and I flash a devilish smile. Looks like the sauna gods have spoken, huh? She splutters. What the hell did you do? I shrug, playing innocent. Must be some technical difficulties. I guess we'll have to find another spot to roast ourselves. 
I leave her standing there, staring at the closed sauna door like it's an unsolvable riddle. As I walk away, I can't help but revel in my sweet revenge. Round two goes to the sauna sensei. The war ain't over, but sauna queen better think twice before messing with the heat master. I'm sure all of you reading this have to log their work time in one way or another. And I'm sure most of you don't agree with the granularity of said logging. So I work in IT. Many years ago, I was involved in a big project, creating a new platform while maintaining the old one. So during the week, I would spend some time on support tickets. My role was more high level. I would never be the one to actually work on a ticket. At one point in time, there was a new support coordinator assigned to the client account. The number of tickets was rising and the team couldn't keep up threatening the new platform. The coordinator needed metrics on the team's performance, so he generated reports from the ticketing and the time logging systems, combined them, and started looking into improvements. Until he came across my logs. The metrics told him I spend about two hours a week and edit a varying amount of tickets. This looks weird and he couldn't bill the client on tickets I worked on, so he asked me what was going on. I explained that I would look over the list of open tickets, bulk update where needed, and log my time with a remark like classified ticket. Then I would move on to my other duties. He didn't like that and told me to enter a time log for each separate ticket I work on. I asked him what the minimum time was that he wanted me to log, which turned out to be 15 minutes. Fast forward a few weeks of me spending an hour a day logging hours and logging that task too, and creating virtual overtime of about an hour a day. Then the coordinator comes up to me with a request to go through and update the full backlog. I'm fine with that and tell him I'm logging that as a generic task and not per ticket. He tells me no, it must be logged per ticket. So finally, the malicious compliance. I spend about two hours to go over the backlog and make sure everything is in order. Then I spend the rest of the day entering everything into the time logging system. Fun fact. I was the first to reach the system's limits but found a workaround to log everything. That day, as logged in the time tracking software, I worked for more than 16 hours. The rest of the week I took it easy, came in late, went home early. I was done for the week and every hour I worked extra would be unpaid, right? When it came time for the invoicing, the coordinator could not justify the huge amount of hours I logged on the account. My rate was twice that of a tech support, and finally he allowed me to stop logging by the ticket. My productivity went up again, as did my mood. I did flag the potential problems and drop in productivity to the CTO and CEO, who I reported to directly, but they said to comply anyway. We did laugh about it afterwards and learned a lesson in how not to waste time. I had no intentions to do a new post, but today absolutely took the cake. To those that don't know, my daughter, six-year-old, was born from a one-night stand with Jeff. We were never romantically involved. It was a simple one-night stand, and we did use contraceptives, but they failed. It happened. A few months ago, Jeff went full psycho and tried to convince me to leave my daughter with him so she could serve as a replacement child for his wife who recently lost their infant daughter. I refused, and right now we're in the middle of some legal issues. Now for today, I thankfully didn't deal with Jeff. Instead, he sent a priest to harass me at work. I'm going to be very blunt. I'm completely detached from religion. I'm not an atheist, just don't really like the idea of the Catholic Church. That's the leading religion in my home country. I respect it, and most of my family is Catholic, so I have a detached respect for church officials. Today I was doing some paperwork when I got a call about a priest asking for me. I didn't have any meetings scheduled, and a lot of times we get visits from clergy asking for donations or participation in events, so I figured that was it. I told the secretary to let him in, and things at first seemed rather polite. Shake hands, asking how things were. The usual chit-chat. Then the priest began talking about how it had come to his attention that I was a single woman with a child, and that apparently I lived a life of debauchery and hate. His words. I was taken aback and uh, agreed I was a single mother, but that I didn't see how I lived in debauchery and hate. The priest then went on about how he knew my daughter is prohibited from spending time with her father and that I'm constantly sleeping around with men instead of living a godly life. How he was worried and thought it would be best I considered giving my daughter a chance to live with a proper family rather than see me sell myself. Angry was an understatement. I did keep it civil simply because I was at work and I had no intentions of screaming to a religious man at work. 
I simply told him that my daughter was fine with me. She lived a safe and happy life. My personal affairs were my own, and that I had no intentions of sending her to another household. I told him that if there was nothing else, he should probably leave as I had other things to attend to. He then showed his hand, and that's how I know it was Jeff's doing. The priest told me he didn't think my daughter would be a happy child with me, but her father was well respected in his church, and he knew he would raise a proper Christian lady. At that, I laugh and simply said, no. I once again recommended he left, and if he didn't, I would be calling security. He left saying he would try to speak to me again when I'm not being hysterical. I told my secretary and our security not to let him into my office again, and I called my lawyer. I don't have audio, but we do have security feed from him walking into my office. Thank you again to everyone sending well wishes in my previous post. We're still working on that move, but school is back and she's loving it. We still have that temporary restraining order against Jeff and his wife. And school officials know it. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.